Cash Bar. Um, bringing up Just Nortney, uh, who will be moderating this group. And we have uh, Dennis Porter who's switching hats and uh, moving into the panel. Uh, Jerry is uh, still here along with Russell. Uh, I do want to make a point that um, you, know, the, you know, the mining industry in South Carolina really is the backbone of, of what we're trying to accomplish in creating a Bitcoin circular economy in South Carolina. The power generation aspect of it is huge. Uh, you know, so many of the sites have been picked over. We put together an inventory of probably about 30 properties you know, in South Carolina. Uh, you know, there, there is still some low-hanging fruit, needless to say, but it's a little tough to get to. Uh, you, know, you mentioned Santee Cooper. That's a challenge, no question about it. Uh, but, um, uh, but I also wanted to invite you, uh, obviously, from an alternate energy standpoint, make sure you check out um, you know, Zydro you know, in our, uh, uh, our sponsor tables. Um, Wayne Travis will be presenting later today on a very unique and new method of generating power as an alternate energy process. So I encourage everybody you know, to look at that. So uh, without me prattling on for any longer, I'm going to hand it over to Justin. All right. Well, thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah. So uh, I think we already did introductions for you guys. So I'll, I'll maybe spend just a brief moment uh, introducing myself uh, and then we'll get into the topic here. So uh, Justin Orkney, as Dennis mentioned, uh, at Duke Energy, and my focus in the company is really on um, the new technologies that we're seeing coming onto the grid, whether it's the renewable generation, electric vehicles uh, at, the, at the home level, you know, smart thermostats, batteries, rooftop solar, all those, all those uh, customer technologies, generation technologies, and uh, how are we going to craft them with policies, with rate designs, programs, that take advantage of them in situations where the grid benefits, obviously the customer that's adopting it benefits, uh, and then even customers that don't have anything to do with it benefit just because they're on the system. And so recently been taking a very serious look at Bitcoin mining as one of those new uh, technologies that as an electric utility, as a system operator, we really need to be paying attention to and uh, start to recognize the unique characteristics of it as a customer and, and the potential benefits and use cases that it can, it can uh, provide. So that's a, enough about me. Um, and I think I'd just kind of like to uh, build off of there. And uh, you know, we hear about the, the headlines coming out of Texas, uh, and it's already been mentioned here. Uh, and probably start with you, Russell, on uh, the, the ability of Bitcoin mining to curtail its operations or to, uh, to shut down, we call it demand response. Um, you know, what, what are the unique characteristics of Bitcoin mining from kind of a technology perspective and, and uh, what, what, what sort of policies or programs do you see beneficial uh, throughout the country and, and what do you prefer? So for our 700 or so megawatts we got on right now, all of it's under some kind of demand response uh, controlled load piece. And what I'm talking about there is we are a 24 7 base load, which, if those in the power business, that's a good thing. But it's even better because our friends at Duke can call us up, and in Duke's, I think it's 30 seconds response, but uh, in, in a very short period of time at ERCOT in Texas, it's a six second response. We can turn off the processing power for the machines and send all that load back to the grid. And again, if you're not power people, you don't understand just how amazing that is, but think of it as one half of a battery you don't have to pay for. So when you increase base load, uh, base load also is very, very clean energy, even like natural gas or something. Think about when you have a grill and you light it up, you, you turn the grill on, gas is escaping, but once you get it lit and you close the thing, it's very clean and it's only dirty again when you open it up and turn everything off. So, you know, whatever you're using for generation, base load that's continuously burning is the cleanest and, and the most efficient as well, which is really important for Duke. So you increase that base load, these guys call us up. There's a hurricane sitting off the coast or something, there's a problem. We gotta send 100 megawatts to Atlanta because it's really hot or we gotta send it down to over to Charlotte because again, it's, it's July and it's 97 degrees and those bankers, they don't like to sweat. So we turn off and then four hours later, 10 minutes later, 45 minutes later, whenever they need that, that we don't need that load again, we're taking it. And in exchange for that, we negotiate a very good rate. <laughs> and they say, okay, because you're gonna take it when, we, when no one else needs it, we get a great rate for that, and that works great for Bitcoin mining. And Jerry talked about this with the, with the wind and solar and all that kind of stuff. So when you look out, like in Texas, in ERCOT, um, 
Texas creates, has an enormous, it's actually the largest in the country for renewable energy. The problem with renewable energy is kind of like this. So renewable energy and Bitcoin mining work really well together because they could both go like this. So Bitcoin mining can follow that volatility. And, and on Texas, there's been a lot of talk about you know growing in Texas. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, Core Scientific, we have, we have a couple facilities there, but we're, 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 we have enough of Texas. Uh, so it's not all great. It, there, there's, there's things in Texas like the desert <laughs> that's very difficult to have data centers in. <laughs> so, uh, so I say that to say we at South Carolina don't have to say, hey, we're competing with this enormous power grid in Texas uh, because things aren't great everywhere. So uh, we have everything we need right here in the state. But on an on a energy basis, it's a, it's a lot of stuff. We'll talk about some more here. So. Also, you know, in regards to like what the services that that Bitcoin can offer to Bitcoin mining can offer not only just demand response, but we're looking at frequency response now, yes. which is incredible. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, there's no, there's very few customers, if any, that can perform like large scale uh, frequency response on the demand side. Because right, typically it's like supply side stuff. But uh, as we're growing our renewable energy mix, like we need more and more and more uh, customers that are willing to perform frequency response, right? Because uh, inertia, which is something that's created by uh, thermal turbines, right? Like the, an object in motion stays in motion. Those thermal turbines can stay in motion relatively for like, I think the, the minimum is like 60 seconds that most people can get now, but, but renewables don't have that. So the moment they stop generating, uh, the moment the plant goes down, it drops and frequency drops. And you have to keep frequency balanced at 60 hertz all the time, no matter what. The electricity that's created hundreds of miles from here was created milliseconds ago. The, the, the lights that are on right now is energy that was created just a fraction of a second ago. Uh, and you have to maintain that supply and demand at all times. Um, you know, so demand response is one thing, but also the potential for Bitcoin mining to come in and perform frequency response not only is great for grid operators who need that, but it's great for the renewable energy industry who's really struggled to increase their penetration because the higher you have, the higher renewable mix you have, the more demand response and the more frequency response you can, you need and Bitcoin mining can perform both of those assets. Well, one thing I <coughs> want to add is, uh, you know, what I started to learn in the past uh, 12 to 18 months about a power industry because of my um, Bitcoin uh, operation is, uh, it's really uh, interesting that uh, the uh, generation, the transmission capacity, they have to be built up to match the maximum uh, potential consumption in service area. So that means uh, even though you have an average load of, uh, let's say, um, 12 gigawatts in the Duke area, but if there's a one hour in the year, it reaches to, I don't know, 22 gigawatts, Duke needs to build uh, the uh, generation and the capacity, uh, transmission capacity for 22 gigawatts. That means the uh, incremental 12 gigawatts uh, cost, that's billions of dollars. So um, what's interesting is uh, Bitcoin, if you uh, curtail at these uh, peak hours, you do not require more uh, capacity investments. Uh, you don't need to bring more uh, generation uh, online. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, you're right on. It's, that's it. Um, Greg, uh, go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself and then... Yeah, so, nope. yeah I'm Greg Ness. I'm one oh. of the uh, principals. So. See if that's better. Yeah, I'm Greg Ness. I'm one of the principals at Southern Current. We're a, one of the largest owner operators and developers of utility scale solar energy in the United States. And uh, our interest in uh, Bitcoin mining peaked, I would say, about a year and a half ago. We started getting calls from uh, a lot of, uh, lot of calls from Miami, from, uh, from California, from Texas, and, and saying, hey, Greg, can you guys, uh, you know, sell us, you know, power, you know, 20, 30, 100 megawatts of power, you know, at, at, a, at X rate directly? And, of course, we said, well, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than what you're accustomed to in, say, Texas and the DREG markets. But at that point, we started uh, sort of looking into it a little bit further. And, you know, to some of the, uh, the folks that spoke earlier, there's a pretty huge opportunity, um, you know, in terms of a synergy between, you know, utility scale generators like ourselves and Bitcoin mining operators for those very reasons, you know, frequency response, um, using them versus going out to the market and getting a lithium ion battery, for instance. Um, you know, especially nowadays with all the, uh, 
massive upstream supply constraints, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. So a lot of what I've been doing the last year is really, you know, educating, you know, mining operations on, you know, what the alternative utility would be to go with solar, whether that's through learning more about the in investment tax credit opportunity that may be available, you know, also just letting them know that, you know, a good, a good business case often with solar is approaching us and saying, where are your sites? Where have you already paid for, um, you know, substation upgrades, line upgrades, you know, do a sublease with us, see if there's any kind of synergies there. So I think it's a, a really a perfect marriage that's, I think, in the making right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's one of the things that, one of the aspects of Bitcoin mining that uh, is, is fairly unique, especially at a large scale industrial customer level. And I think the, it was already mentioned earlier, being location agnostic, being able to more or less uh, locate wherever it's um, most beneficial, uh, you know, and whether that's <laughs> because uh, a country like um, China is, you know, becoming a little bit unfriendly to the industry and you got to go across the ocean to somewhere else, or, you know, maybe there's just a place on the system that has uh, a large amount of renewable energy, like West Texas, that uh, doesn't have the transmission to uh, deal with the, the excess uh, production. You know, something I hear when I'm having conversations in the utility is, uh, you know, well, are the miners gonna, do they wanna shut down? Um, are, they, are they gonna be willing participants in the grid? And I think, you know, just maybe this is a real quick answer, but for everybody out there that might not be convinced, you know, what, what is at least your perspective on the industry in terms of, of being this, this participant? Yeah, I, I, I can take a stab at it. At that. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, Bitcoin mining is a business, so it's uh, profit driven. Uh, so if you are in a, for argument's sake, in uh, Duke's uh, territory, right, they have a uh, power share uh, construct where you commit up to, I think, 200 hours and you, ha you can save a uh, you know, certain amount of money. So. If you don't, you know, you, 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 you don't make that money and it's more uh, potentially more profitable than mining. So that there's a huge uh, economic incentive to do that. Um, and in other areas that are kind of like a, a ISOs, uh, the incentives can even be more, uh, you know, drastic, like in a uh, quote in Texas. Sometimes, you know, the, the price of uh, electricity can be massive, you know. We, we all heard of the $9,000 per uh, megawatt hour uh, last February, um, which actually some Bitcoin miners made, uh, you know, more money than mining many times for that one hour. However, they did provide that uh, access capacity back to the grid when the grid needs the most. So. Uh, I think uh, we can see Bitcoin miners as a virtual plant to some extent. Yeah, I mean, plain and simple, the costs that go into building the infrastructure in order to maintain frequency and ensure that the grid is operable, uh, those costs are so high and often passed down to ratepayers um, that the utilities are willing to pay people to curtail. They're willing to pay people to participate in these programs because it just makes more sense. So Bitcoin mining really is, in my opinion, going to become a massive part of infrastructure, utility scale infrastructure all across the planet uh, because it can perform those programs better than any industry ever in history. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Uh, being the scale we are at core, and we have this opportunity in South Carolina, but there's, there's nations courting Bitcoin miners because of the benefit to the, because specifically the benefit to the utility grid. The fact that it's taken our country all these years to get there is kind of weird to me, but uh, again, at the private sector, Duke gets it, TVA gets it. Um, Rick Perry, a couple years ago, his former governor of Texas, he was secretary of, um, the, he was the secretary of energy. Anyway, we went to Mr. Perry and, and he immediately got TVA involved. He, he got it really quick. His, his staff got it really quick, uh, but the benefits are, are enormous for us as ratepayers and users on the grid to have to have this large load that has so much flexibility. And it's funny to me to watch folks talk. We, we talk about the carbon footprint of Bitcoin and the carbon footprint of energy. And yes, those are all bad things that need to be addressed. 
but that that's a generation level. The the benefit to the grid, it, it we we have not done a good job of educating everybody. I guess I should say, because the benefits to the grid are enormous. Yeah. And and so Greg, that's a perfect segue to what I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, as a as a developer of renewable energy, um, and you were I think you kind of touched on it earlier. Are you are you seeing Bitcoin mining as as an enabling technology that might even bring forward more renewable energy onto the system um, quicker and, and more economically than, you know, because, for example, um, again, not to, not to beat a dead horse, but we know about West Texas. It's not the only place in the country that has that type of market dynamics. There's, you know, all the way up the wind belt, you see similar negative pricing, active curtailments, whether it's solar or wind. Uh, even California, Hawaii, I mean, you name it. Um, and then even in a place uh, like the Carolinas and, and others, there might be interconnection congestion where you have these large upgrade costs in order to bring a system online. And you have the cost, you also just have the time. Um, what, what are you seeing in terms of maybe co-locating Bitcoin mining as a win-win-win scenario? So to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, like I said earlier, it's, it's highly synergistic from that frequency, um, you know, grid regulation perspective. You know, and as far as, uh, you know, taking it and, you know, kind of making it as an ancillary use to some of our facilities, it's, I think it's intuitive to some extent because a lot of times, you know, especially solar wind companies, you know, we've done the heavy lifting. We've gone out to these different um, communities and we've, you know, gotten zoning approvals. We've sort of introduced the you know, the city or county to kind of this, uh, you know, sort of, you know, grid centric project that we're doing and, and adding Bitcoin, you know, is, is almost like a kind of a win win for these jurisdictions because it's half the times, you know, we've done the, the work, you know, getting the permitting, you know, getting the variances, getting the CUPs approved. And so coming back in and then tacking on Bitcoin to a project is, is fairly simplistic. It, it doesn't take up much space. You know, a lot of times all the uh, the grading and infrastructure work's already been done. So, I, I you know, I think it's going to, you know, really, really pick up the pace in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, what was that? <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and kind of, kind of dovetailing on that in terms of, of being that enabling technology, um, you know, what... Are there, are there policies? I know we already touched on how the Carolinas uh, are, are a very uh, friendly landscape, welcoming landscape. Uh, perhaps Duke Energy has, has good rates and programs. Are there other policies that, um, that maybe don't exist yet anywhere in terms of taking advantage of the lo location agnostic aspect, um, the curtailability, the, the scalability? You know, those are the three things I think that are just very unique to Bitcoin mining. It can go anywhere. It can be any size, and it can be on or off at any hour of the year. Uh, and you just don't find that really with any other technology. Um, so maybe speak to some, some policies. Uh, I'll go to you, Dennis, on, on just how you see taking advantage of, and, and when it's operating, it's, it's printing money. Um, so that's, that's pretty interesting, too. Uh, how can we take advantage of this? What, what sort of policies are we looking at here? Yeah. So, uh, you know, s side note here, real quick, is that I'm, you know, I'm not a miner. Uh, we have these great people in the energy industry, and also miners here today. But I work. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Satoshi Action Fund, which is a C4 that builds model policy for Bitcoin mining exclusively. So we're focused on trying to craft things that kind of help with the next wave of Bitcoin mining. Because you guys are doing is going after all the opportunities that are already out there. But you know, for instance, like you said, Texas is it's it's filling up. Uh, other states. Uh, they're starting to realize that this new industry is taking over and they want to try to maybe put the brakes on things and start to study it. Uh, but we, what we want to do is unlock energy across this country and help us to build new energy assets. So we have multiple pieces of model policy. Um, some of it has been introduced in New Hampshire. We have other states poised to introduce this policy as well. Obviously hoping with uh, Dennis over here that we'll be introducing some policy as well here in South Carolina. But the premise is basically that we want Bitcoin miners to be able to participate in the grid as much as possible. Uh, and so we've created a piece of policy called a Microgrid and Grid Resiliency Act, which essentially creates microgrid zones that you can build a microgrid within. Um, the, the, the problems with microgrids in the past is uh, your funding, right, and the ability to offload excess energy. The grid doesn't want it. 
right? Because they have to pay for it. They'd rather create their own, generate and, uh, and sell their own electricity. So the microgrid zone allows you to build generation, co-locate with Bitcoin miners, and consume all the electricity on site. And the thing that we said was to get the utilities on board was, okay, well, if and when the grid interconnection does occur, that you must perform demand response within certain parameters, and you must perform frequency re response in perfect parameters. So it creates this like microgrid zone, virtual power plant, uh, and that's where we see the next wave of, of policy being able to unlock this asset, because although there are plenty of business opportunities out there that are currently available to Bitcoin miners, those are going to slowly kind of dwindle over time, and we need to look to the future on how we can use Bitcoin mining to unlock new generation in this country. In particular, we're big fans of, 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 of nuclear energy, and uh, we think that New Hampshire and many other states are going to see that opportunity. Jerry, uh, I know, uh, how, about, how about rate design or, or any, any policies like that? Uh, you have thoughts to share? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, we we are be, be, be beyond uh, South Carolina. We're also looking at projects elsewhere. Uh, I just find that the energy market to be very uh, disparate. Uh, that there, there are semi-regulated regions, the re fully regulated, there are wholesale. You you name it. it it's all all over the place, um, and. Uh, one example is, you know, we, uh, we went to an area, uh, it's in the north, uh, Midwest and north, and um, they have this uh, coincidental peak uh, concept, uh, and they do it uh, every month. So if you had uh, the uh, monthly peak, uh, you are penalized for, you know, certain transmission costs, which I understand. They just seem to be very inflexible in, you know, um, kind of accommodating, you know, a flexible user like us. Everything needs to go get approved by FERC. And uh, um, even though they have a very abundant, they have a lot of power that are generated, I don't even know where all the power, you know, goes to, because their, their industry it has uh, shrunk by half over the past two decades. Uh, so like, I think that there needs to be sort of a federal level review how um, the rates are reviewed. You know, it seems like uh, the process can be very, very long. Maybe uh, that's something Dennis can uh, help. We're very active and engaged in conversations on the state level. Um, we find the federal government to be slow and monotonous. Uh, they don't get anything done. Uh, so we're big fans of organizations uh, like here in South Carolina, as well as Texas Blockchain Council, Ohio Blockchain Council. These are really pivotal players in the fight to move the right uh, direction. But we're also going to be getting engaged with the public utility commissions, which is, I think, where the real big fight is going to be. That's where solar won. Uh, I think that's where Bitcoin mining can win, too. What's very uh, interesting to me is uh, we, we, we are doing a pilot project to actually create a utility company in, in one of the states. So we, that, that, that's something maybe uh, we can work together. <laughs> Greg, any thoughts on policies? And then maybe we can yeah. take a question or two. So I would say my dream policy at the federal level would probably be to try to get Bitcoin mining operations included in the ITC. I think that would take, make it take off, you know, allow for more institutional investment and really just really just prove the case for Bitcoin being a demand frequency response asset that's compatible with renewable energy technology. So I think the takeaway is that there's a lot of opportunities here for win-win-win scenarios uh, that, that are hopefully right at the forefront. Any questions here? Let me or, add one thing real fast. I'm not sure if anyone here is involved, but very simple in South Carolina, if we want to increase Bitcoin mining, create a rate card at the Public Service Commission. They're right across the office. From my, I live at, I live in Columbia. I'd even go over there and sit down with them. If you create a rate card with the Public Service Commission that has all the characteristics of Bitcoin mining, so that the guys at Duke, Dominion, and Santee Goober go, oh, I really like that. We can create a rate that also guys like Jerry go, oh, I'll I'll do more Bitcoin mining in South Carolina. It's a, it's, so it's not a it's not a hard concept. The microgrids are awesome, and it's going to be a look good long term solution. I think the microgrids are a good long term solution for the whole utility grid in North America, but. Here in South Carolina specifically, the way we're structured, since we have this uh, 
fascist system where we <laughs> we let the government run everything. Um, we need to go to go to our elect, go to our elected officials, whoever appoint the public service commission, and, and walk them through how to create a rate card that solves the pro that, that does, is not antagonistic between the utility and the Bitcoin miner, but lets them work symbiotically together so that we improve the grid because it absolutely is 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 a good thing for us as a state. Let's sit down and uh, get a rate schedule together. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. I think. If you'd asked me this question a year ago, my answer would be very different. <laughs> Power costs globally, courtesy of our friend Mr. Putin, have gone crazy. Uh, a year ago, our all in power at core, fleet wide across seven states, was about 2.3 cents a kilowatt hour, which, um, again, as with all that flexibility, now it's, it's, it's more than twice that. Um, I think if I were starting out right now in South Carolina and I could get a rate that was, you know, sub four or five cents with the flexible load I, where I give back, you know, two or three hundred hours a year, I'm willing to, to do that out of the 8,600 hours a year, I'd be very happy. So controlled load response, they have a couple of different variable controlled load response. Uh, some where ERCOT comes in and takes over and ERCOT can, can push you to, to turn off and some are voluntary turnoffs, uh, depending on the economic parameters. Jerry talked about where, you know, the, the price of, of power got so high, you were economically in inclined to say, you know what, I'll just give back. Uh, the, the, some of the biggest issues Texas is having right now is they're rightly so scared of Bitcoin mining because there's a lot of requests come in for, for load and it scared them. There was, it, this was asinine, but there was 17 gigawatts of request. And I sat there and I told the guy from Ercot, I said, you, you just told me 17 gigawatts. I said, that's every mining machine on the planet for the next decade that's in production. And every silicon chip that every t manufacturer in the world can make coming to Texas. So 17 gigs is out of the question. So some of it's just a matter of they got thrown in the face and got scared. Um, but their issue is, is, is he touched on it. Where Texas's generation is and where its transmission is are two different things. Their population's on one side of the state and all the generations on the other. And that's the issue Texas has got to solve. All right, I want to thank our panel. Um, a round of applause uh, for our second mining group. And you know, one of the reasons we're emphasizing mining so much, of course, is because it is a critical infrastructure you know, for the digital economy. And um, uh, having a position in this, you know, in this industry is very important to, you know, to the state. Um, I will add also, um, and I'll give you an idea where all this is going. Right now, there's a 27% uh, uh, proposed increase from Dominion. You know, it's blown projects out of the water already. Uh, the 20% um, uh, increase from Duke, my understanding, and you know, obviously, this fuel cost is a big deal. I mean, the natural gas fuel cost. So um, having those, um, you know, understanding where it is, understanding where we are, is just half the battle. Uh, but um, you know, in the uh, legislative hearings that they'll be having. Um, you know, they're going to be looking at individual topics, and we're going to lobby for that you know, so that we can have a specific, you know, session with the uh, House uh, ad hoc committee, uh, really talk about the industry from that standpoint, let them know what it's all about. Uh, the, uh, one of the proposals from the, uh, from the utility companies, you know, to the, uh, uh, to, the, uh, 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 to the committee was give them the opportunity to negotiate individual rates. Pretty simple concept, right? But you know, in a high, in a fully regulated state, that just doesn't happen. So some of these are easy lifts, is really what it comes down to. So uh, the um, uh, but uh, you know, getting to that next step is the challenge. So I want to thank everybody. We're going to switch out. Uh